to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Saturday, July 20th, the Fantasy Footballers. Are you writing down the date, Jason? Yeah, wait. This is how he learns the date. This is the 20th? When the show starts. That's crazy. Where his calendar? Because that's later than you thought? We're so close. We're so close to August, to everyday shows, to football and drafts. Are you ready for the everyday shows? Like, have you been? You I know? am. I am totally ready. I've. Uh, I, I did my. I did my fasting, and um, I'm. I'm prepped. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it's coming quick. We've got camp, and then we've got preseason, and then uh, I begin my title defense in our league of record. Are you? I mean, you got to be looking forward to that. I remember the feeling. <laughs> Which have we talked about our draft? Uh, you mean the fact that our League of Record draft is happening the day of kickoff? That's what I'm talking about. We we are giving that a go this year. First We're, time ever. Yeah. Look, scheduling, the as you all know, scheduling your draft, an online draft can be extremely difficult. Add in that it's an in-person draft and people are traveling even harder. Well, we decided to take it up a notch and say, this, is, gonna, this is when it's going to be, so everyone figure this out. We decided on the draft last year of, we're going to draft that Thursday. That look when I guess when you run the company, you, we can we we call it a half day, and we're bringing everybody <laughs> in. <laughs> and we're and drafting that day, having the big draft party, and then seeing players that night. It is so exciting. I'm I'm curious what does it do to strategy because there's going to be people who just you think they just draft oh, to people watch? Are, the, oh, people are going to reach on ADP to get a player in that game because they're going to be night. watching it together. Yeah, right? as a league. Yep, that will be fun. I'm so. Pumped we just for need it. to make sure we get through the draft before the kickoff. I love that Mike's like, "Oh, we'll do a half day." <laughs> there ain't no work that day at all. I was trying will, to save face for the people, Jason. We will have to record a show. <laughs> That's a holiday. Yeah, yeah I mean, it'll be fun. It'll be record the show and then. Hey, Work's it's, done. <laughs> hey, it's me, Al, and I've got a solo episode today. Um, I'm hoping for a better year in Dynasty. Is that a good impression, Al? It was spot on. Yeah. It's better um, than his other voice. It's me. <laughs> hey, guys. Al. Sorry, Al. Um, we love you. Divisional breakdowns. We're into the NFC today, taking on the NFC North. So that'll be fun. we got a great quick question. Uh, I'm excited to talk through uh it's a team question so we'll get to that shortly the live show in los angeles coming up very soon as well jason once we hit august that'll be here before you know it saturday august 24th at palace theater ballerslive.com for that and of course the ultimate draft kit available right now dominate your draft prep up get ready you know if you want to overcome all of the tilt and the tilt potential that comes with draft day, which it's real. Everybody's got a great plan, and then, you know, pick or two in, you're, you start to freak out. Jump into the ultimate draft kit. The best, the best thing you can do there is just kind of learn. Like, we try to equip you with that tool to make decisions in the context of your league and league format. It, it's a lot different than it was 20 years ago when everybody played in the exact same league with the exact same type of format, Limited scoring options. Um, everybody plays in, in in nuanced leagues now. And our job on this show every day and with the Ultimate Draft Kit is to equip you to be able to make contextual decisions for your team, which means things like the upside and risk rankings. So when you make picks in the first few rounds, you are balancing your team out with upside, with risk, with opportunity, with depth. Mm -hmm. And you're drafting based on tiers. You're taking a look at and making sure that it's not just like, oh, this player is ranked three spots ahead of that player, but it's like, oh, this player is basically the same as five players later. Let me go to a different position. It, it's a, it's a, it's a good tool if you haven't used it in the past. It, uh, I mean, we we hear every year how much that has helped people, 
Uh, so yeah, check it out. UltimateDraftKit.com. And yeah, just to the customizable settings side, you do import your league settings so that your rankings are specific to your league and your league context, so it helps you a little bit better. Our quick question of the day is simple. It is which team do you believe will surprise for fantasy football? We we are in the middle of the, the divisional breakdowns. There's a couple teams on today's show I thought about going with. Me too. But I feel like we're going to talk about those teams, so I pump the brakes. Mm. <laughs> Was that, a, was that a chicken? <laughs> that was like one lonely chicken with one breath left. <laughs> it's dying. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I will go with a team that we've talked about already on the AFC Divisional Breakdown shows. You are a madman. I'm going to go with Tennessee. That would be surprising. Um, Tennessee is uh, a team that, look, every year, I, I'm going to repeat myself all off season. There's a handful of teams that you think are going to be terrible that provide not just medium, but tremendous fantasy football value last year. Drafting a Houston Texan was not something anybody wanted to do or try to do. And there was value top to bottom on that roster from the wide receiver core that surprised to a rookie quarterback, to a tight end, to Devin Singletary, it so was this year's CJ Stroud, according to Andrew Holloway, is Will Levis. Honestly, you heard it here. I don't mind that comp. I don't mind that comp because you you've been the one all offseason talking about how CJ Stroud's numbers weren't really that wild. I think that those kind of numbers could be put up by Will Levis. You have a an offensive coordinator there bringing this, you know, Cincy South with a high pass rate over expectation, with two running backs that catch the football. When I look at surprise teams for fantasy, the fact that they're going to pivot to a pass-heavy offense with two uh, borderline elite wide receivers, with Hopkins at this stage in his career, Calvin Ridley, two running backs that can catch the football, Tajay Spears and Tony Pollard, and a uh, they're not a bad defense. They're middle-of-the-pack defense. So I'm not worried about their philosophy being the old-school Vrabel uh, we're going to try to hit you in the mouth and then run the football down your throat. So to me, and yes, I'm going to include Will Levis in that pack of five names that I think I think Will Levis will be streamed by people this year. I, think I you, agree with that. I think yes. you will start to enter the territory of, of the ancient Jameis Winston days at minimum of like, look, this guy's going to chuck it down the field. And he's got players that are going to beat people down the field. You know, that is, he didn't have Calvin Ridley last year. And... You know, now he's got a full off season, right? He took over during part of last year. This is a a big step and opportunity. No, I, I I actually really like I I love making fun of takes, but at the same time, I it's really uh, it's a really smart take. If you look at where ADP is, and and we know every year that there are teams like this that are just undervalued offensively, and then they they take a step forward. There's a lot of reasons, you know, the the Calvin Ridley, Tony Pollard change of head coach. Yeah, and a year two, coordinator. year two for the quarterback. There are so many of those. Like those can all be yellow flags. Like if this was a really good offense the year before, you you could be worried. But they weren't a great offense, and so I I, I like that. Um, let, me, I, let me throw one more stat out there. Kyle mentioned this, and I'm not predicting Tennessee will win the division, but just to show the kind of turnover in the NFL since 2015, at least one team drafting inside the top ten has won their division the same year. Yeah, I mean, almost, so that's nine straight years of somebody in the top ten making the jump. First to first to first. Yeah, um, I'm gonna go uh, next. I, Mike, you, you, you took the team that I was really close to taking here, but I want to highlight I the put Chargers it in after you, though. I, well, but I, that's what I'm saying. I was really, I, okay. I was between I these you, two teams, you. so I, I obviously already love your take. Um, for me, it's the Chargers. The Chargers are. Maybe maybe it won't surprise you, but it will certainly surprise the average draft position of all these players because they are not draft. They are drafted like they are like a bottom five offense right now. There's a lot made of the loss of weapons and a lot made of this is a team that wants to come in and run the ball with Harbaugh and Greg Roman. Lad McConkey's their first wide receiver. And I'm seeing him being drafted as wide receiver 41. He is in the eighth round. As the eighth round is their first player drafted on sleeper. Uh, Gus Edwards is in the tenth round. Justin Herbert is in the tenth round. Like you're paying nothing. The first for, player on the Chargers. The first is player, drafted in the eighth round. That's correct. Um, in uh, on for a team with almost 
what, like a projected 10 wins? I think they are eight and a half. Uh, some platforms have them at nine and a half. But, yeah, th this is a team that has a good coach. This is a team that has a great quarterback. No one is saying, you know, despite the, the lacking of, of playoff victories, Justin Herbert is a great quarterback. You have also a, an offensive coordinator here. When, when I look at history and things that are repeatable, I like finding an offensive coordinator who has 10 seasons as an OC and seven of his 10 years have been a top 10 scoring offense. Uh, when I look at my team-by-team -team projections in the UDK, uh, I've got the Chargers as one of the most efficient offenses on a yards-per-play basis because I think this is going to be a hyper-efficient team. And so this is where I think at the end of the year we're going to look back and be like, man, Gus Edwards was a 10th round pick. Lad McConkey was an eighth or who, who that's may, the may, hard part for right. Them. Maybe it's Palmer. Maybe it's lad. Maybe it's uh huge. Like if I just gave you one for free to pick from the roster, that's the differentiator between Tennessee and, and the chargers. Like the chargers are probably a better football team. We know. I mean, I think we all would acknowledge that Tennessee. I can point at four guys and say, those are the four guys that I would take the shot on. I'm not sure who to take the shot on in, in, in Los Angeles. Yeah, I mean, I for me, my my, my belief in, in Lad being the primary target, it's it's easier. But obviously, um, I don't think it's bad to take a shot on any of them because you're not paying a lot. And one of these wide receivers will be a relevant, you know, so top take a, 36 wide receiver for sure. Take a late round shot at a surprise. Yeah, Palmer, Quentin Johnson. The team is going to be better than how we're currently drafting I think them you in should fantasy take football. Quentin Johnson. I think that's who you should – I think that should be your dude. Well, I will take oh, him off of the God. waiver wire for free. Oh, man. I will I will pay you a lot to make Quentin Johnson your my guy. A lot. Mm. We'll have to talk. I've got a golden ticket here, Andy. <laughs> I could change your opinion on anything. Okay. All right. Mike, uh, surprise team for fantasy. It can um, go either direction, by the way, if you if you want to oh, pick Oh, I, I went with a positive one. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's the Seattle Seahawks. I think that their offense will be better than they are – currently being valued like the Chargers where they have a they have a higher drafted player in DK Metcalf who is let me check it real quick he is going as the wide receiver 23 in the fourth round meanwhile let's see where did DK finish he was the wide receiver 16 last year so in, in the year where everything was felt like it was terrible for Seattle he was still the wide receiver 16 18 the year before that so they are not being valued that way and there, there is a way that you can look at the stats and go. They, it was they just missed, uh, like Geno's Geno Smith's yards per game, passing yards per game, very similar, ten yards different per game. His adjusted completion percentage. That's when you take out throwaways and things that were the wide receivers' fault. Basically identical to what he had two years ago when he led the league in, in completion percentage. They were eleventh in yards per play, but. They dropped from ninth as a scoring offense down to 17th because they were 32nd in time of possession. And they have made huge sweeping changes. Uh, it, more, more specifically to me, the, the OC, Jason, which you have you brought him up. Ryan Grubb from the University of Washington. Many times. like, And it's it's the second year of JSN. It's they're, They are fascinating to me. Of like We've seen their quarterback be more than competent. We've seen him be very good. DK... It, maybe not everyone looks at him and says that's a superstar, but DK Metcalf is regarded as a very good wide receiver in the NFL. Tyler Lockett had a down year, yet they still brought him back. Right? He got a yeah, he, he got a deal. Yeah, he got yeah, a contract. I, he's on my dynasty team, so I got him a deal. He got a contract extension. It's year number two for the first receiver drafted in the 2022 draft. Like, it's so wild of. Who did this, come into the year injured last year? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Didn't he, had, a full, he had the wrist problem. Didn't get a full season. And it's like this should be a really high-powered offense, and yet we are the drafters are not treating well, them we've, anything like that. We've been here before with Seattle two years ago. They were one of the most underrated. Yeah, they were they were group, Siberia. They were the under one of the most underrated groups that benefited fantasy players the most when they took a shot on. Like there, it's not impossible. But which, by the way, we did a mock draft episode on Thursday. You can go back and listen to it. Kyle the Borgogan participated with us. Tyler Lockett was either, uh, I believe, he was the last round of that draft, and I and you're seeing him. I mean, we we were in Scotty Fish. Yeah. 
uh, which took, I think we took Lockett. We did. We, we took it. It was like late. in the 59th was, round. That's what it felt like. <laughs> and so, but, but there's a world where like three weeks into the season, we're all shaking our head going, oh, yeah, Tyler Lockett is just the you're same like, yeah, you're like, type oh, he of just, player. He had a bad year. And, so, and he's still good. And on top of all of those things, like where you know, like Tennessee has a you're like I think they have a middle of the road defense. The Chargers could it be a middle of the road defense? I think Seattle's defense is going to be stinky doo doo, and you get a high powered offense and and a bad defense, brother. That is where it is at. Yes, uh, we do root for bad defenses. <laughs> Sorry, in fantasy Sorry, football. Defenders. So thirtieth in yards allowed and dead last in first downs allowed. If if they want to continue that, yeah. Please um, and thank you. <laughs> uh, oh, my good, goodness. Good, good thoughts, Jay. Um, <laughs> we will take a break. We'll come back with our divisional breakdown. Please and thank you. No, I believe it was peas. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was real That cute. is what I heard. It was please, but you uh, said please. Oh, I, I did hear peas. I thought you said peas. Peas yeah. and thank you. I heard you. peas. Yeah. I thought it was one of those more. Owl said you said peas. All right. Do we have it unanimous? We'll have to, we'll have to check the tape on Wait, that one. But hold, no, hold no, on. From my heart, it was please you and were, thank you. You were telling me you you believed you didn't say peas? I am saying I attempted to say please. Like, it's, my goal You missed was, a whole letter. Well, I'm going to have to rewind the tape. <laughs> I genuinely thought this was another one of the more household like Yeah, I did too. Phrases like his little uh, no tanks. set my piggies free or whatever <laughs> else he's got. All right, let's jump into the divisional breakdowns. Let's get divisional. Welcome to the NFC. We are starting with the NFC North. Looking at um, a very fun division, I think, mm -hmm. to break down with lots of fantasy football players that are going to be relevant this year. Taking a look at, uh, you know, players um, – Heading it onto these rosters and leaving rookies, coaches, offensive philosophies, and where we see this division um, at the end of the season. So, um, you know, Detroit was the story of last year 12 and 5, Green Bay at 9 and 8, the emergence of Jordan Love. Minnesota went through injury nightmares with Jeff Jefferson and Cousins going down, Cousins out the door. And then Chicago, you know, number one pick in the draft. Uh, well, yeah, that was the traded for pick. Correct. Yes. Uh, they they had the opportunity to – I mean, that's the headline for them is Caleb Williams arrives, Justin Fields departs, and there's a lot of optimism, right? Like the uh, – I mean, spoiler alert for later in the show, but coach of the year odds, the number one most likely coach of the year right now. Guns Mahoney? No, it's <laughs> Matt Eberflus with Chicago. Oh. So there's expectations there throughout this division, and – um We'll start with the talk of the town last year, Detroit, twelve and five. Uh they were up at seven by seventeen points at halftime in the NFC title that. game. Yeah, this was they were right on the cusp of the Super Bowl. Still a hugely successful year. And I'm I'm just gonna tell you right now, like if this wasn't the division we were covering today, I would have talked about him in that in that quick question about the team to surprise because I I think that Detroit is going to be so unbelievably good this year. Oh. So you think they're going to surprise because their expectations yes. are sky high for them. I just think, yes, because I think there are opportunities for surprise I on mean, this team. What did we got? So we have the tight end one in a, it, Laporte is number one in ADP, yes, he right? Is. He is. Amon Ra's what, like wide receiver five, maybe? Gibbs is right around there, too. Well, I just think you're going to have upper echelon performances in particular from Gibbs, Goff, and the surprise performance from Jamison Williams in a full season okay. in an offense that I think will be the best in football. I mean, we have talked extensively about the beginning of the season for Jared Goff and what this offense should be able to do. This is the fourth in points per game last year, eighth in pace of play. They had a top 10 fantasy quarterback last year. They had two of the top 12 fantasy running backs. They have a projected win total of 10 and a half uh, going into this year. I am just... Like, it's coming together, and they have the coaching staff to keep things yeah. much like Shanahan in, like, San Francisco. We are no longer surprised when they just do what they do, right? The machine keeps going. I am expecting that sans injuries from Detroit, 
Um, they fell short of their goal last year. Ben Johnson, the offensive coordinator, who had overtures from lots of teams, he's on the way back. The defense, in my opinion, will improve. I, I am just – I'm enamored with Detroit from a fantasy perspective. From from an NFL perspective, I completely completely get it, and and really fantasy, I'm an, you know I, I I'm a big fan as well. This is a team that's favored in 13 of their 17 games, and they have probably one of the 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 greatest n total number of continuity players, coaches. Like this is the same team running it back. They I mean, just they, paid Jared Goff um, 200 plus million dollars. Yeah, they've got the uh, second most expensive offensive line in the league, which is currently going into this season, PFF's number one, one ranked offensive line. And Jared Goff is – Give him an offensive line. Exactly. Like, he is not the world's best quarterback. But if you protect him and give him a pocket, he's going to sure look like he's up there with the best of the best. And so, yeah, I, I, I do totally get it. But their defense, I think, will be improved. Um, that will – you maybe help the running game, maybe hurt the the passing game a little bit, and there are some question marks here from fantasy. You you said you ex I don't know if you said you expect Jamison Williams to take a step forward. Absolutely, but in the in, I mean, what what does that mean? A step because a step forward could fantasy be like relevance. maybe he has five hundred yards. No fantasy relevance beyond the world of do I start Josh Reynolds? Who their, their one departure, like a, a meaningful a meaningful role with meaningful production. Uh, not top 12. I mean, I, I'm just talking right. about uh, a regular expectation going into the week that Jamison Williams is going to be a part of the game plan, which I think can happen. And I, I do think, I mean, I know that you're paying a premium on Sam Laporta. I think it's very possible that Sam Laporta delivers on that. Like, the reason we don't like him isn't because we don't think Sam Laporta is good. It's just because you have to pay so much, so you're making a bet about repeating especially in the touchdown total, it's very difficult to do year to year. And so you're saying, hey, I don't want to take that risk when I can get value on Mark Andrews and I can get value on Kyle Pitts and Dalton Kincaid yeah. and these other guys. Yeah, the return on your investment is lower because it's because Sam Laporta, let's say he finishes again as, as the tight end one. Is he blowing away the number two tight end by like multiple points per game? I don't think so, which Prob he has to. Probably not. But if the number two tight end isn't the one you thought that it was going to be, then then it might not matter. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, if, 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 if he blows away the next two or three, it would have to be that he'd have to beat out Kelsey, yes. McBride, and Andrews by multiple points per and game. And he's he's two twelve, right? We're not in the Gronk territory or Kelsey. He's not a yeah. first round draft pick. I'm just saying there's an outcome, in my opinion, with the you're attached to the one of the best offenses in football. There's an outcome where Laporta is clearly the number one. Yeah, that's why he's being drafted as the number one. I, I I find myself a little bit more out just based on like regression data. This is a player who had ten touchdowns on eight hundred and eighty nine yards. His expectation was more like six and a half touchdowns. And over the last decade, every single tight end with ten touchdowns under nine hundred receiving yards regressed pretty heavily in touchdowns the next year. So that's my that's my only fear. But you also have a rookie going into year two. Correct. And at tight end, who's to say you know that that he's not going to take a leap forward as a player. The opportunity is there without uh, Josh Reynolds. So, and if you don't I, believe in Jamison Williams, which I, right, I got sure. the underlying thought that maybe you don't, yeah, then don't. then Laporta, oh, no, Laporta's, Jason. yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm so sad for you. <laughs> well, hey, it's crazy because you and I loved him coming I, into the that's league. That's why I'm sad. He, he was my number. The league, so you giving up on him is just shows uh, your conviction is weak. Yeah, that, that I, it shows my conviction is weak where I <laughs> your, stay water and look at what happens in the NFL. conviction is rough, and my victory lap continues. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, he's just he's been on the field so much and done so little that it, it's very difficult. But, yeah, I love him coming out of college. He's my number two wide receiver, and I'm 1 million percent fine taking a shot on him. He's in the 10th round as the wide receiver 48. He's got explosive speed on one of the best offenses as the number two wide receiver. There's plenty. Like I'll I'll draft plenty of Jamison Williams. I assume no, no, it's no, not I will not let work. you. I assume it's not going to work for him. But the the risk reward is 100 percent there. There's almost no risk, and the reward could be a really exhilarating season. Mike, talk about that early season schedule. Oh, brother! So we open up at home against the Los Angeles Rams, and look for if if you've been in fantasy football. 
Jared Goff at home in the Dome is that you know you can play him. And then especially if you add in, this is a defense that we expect you'll be able to beat. That's when Jared Goff really thrives. You open at home against the Rams. Then week two is at home against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which maybe they maybe they fixed some things, but at least last year this that was a team, that was a secondary that you knew you could exploit for crazy yardage. Week three, on the road against Arizona. Week four, against Seattle, the, the, the defense I just proclaimed to be doo-doo. So, I mean, like, this four-game stretch is really set up for the Lions as a whole and for Jared Goff if, like, if you're waiting. And it, we've kind of talked about the strategy of we really like Jaden Daniels as a, as a sleeper quarterback because he's going so late. But if you're not comfortable – going into the season only with him as your guy going a combo of Goff and Daniels is like it, it's such a a good start to me. Jared Goff has 3 like the Lions have 3 total outdoor games in the year. That's what three. I'm talking about. So he's always been better home and dome as you said. His games at Ford Field over the last 2 years, his pace was 4700 yards and 43 passing touchdowns. That's insane. So let let's let me let me flip it to the other side. Cuz it's Detroit so sometimes things can go wrong. And so if, if there's a player that is going to be drafted with expectation that does not perform, is it David Montgomery? Is it Jared Goff? Is it, what is the name for you? It, I mean, in truth, most, is it of the, most of the time when a player really, really turns out to be a very bad pick, it's an injury. Jameer Gibbs is an undersized running back that you're drafting in the first round. So he probably carries the most risk, right? David Montgomery is a sixth rounder. And while David Montgomery, you know, I've got him projected to lose quite a bit of work to Jameer Gibbs. I've got Jameer Gibbs as my running back three this season. Uh, the passing volume that I expect Jameer Gibbs to have in this offense um, is outstanding. The fact that Jameer Gibbs, I didn't even realize until prepping for the show, he had 10 rushing touchdowns. That's crazy. Um, he was He was outstanding as a rookie. Uh, most rookies who perform well as a running back in rookie season, they increase in the next yes. year. And I, I don't see how you don't give him more work. So, really, it's injury risk with him. I think when he's on the field, he's going to be outstanding. And I'm not going to shy away because he's so fast, sometimes he doesn't get tackled. You know, he's like running out of bounds past people. Only 316 receiving yards for Gibbs. So, again, if you're out on Jamison Williams and you look at where vacated targets can leak into – it can be the running back position historically where we saw the workload increase for Jameer Gibbs over the back half of the year. I think the – this and this is just devil's advocate because I'm in on Jameer Gibbs with you guys. Of Gibbs can Gibbs to me is a player with the talent and the opportunity to finish RB1. That's in the range of outcomes for him. The way it goes bad to me, it not, not just injury, it's the team decides – now nah, we need to get back to if we're in the five, it's it's only David Montgomery, which that's not what happened after the bye week, uh, when both guys were back on the field. It was like Montgomery's still getting a bunch of work, but Gibbs was seeing far more than he had uh, before the roles really switched. So that's that's the only concern to me with Jameer Gibbs, and I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, last four games of the season uh, inside the five yard line, Gibbs had at least one or two carries in in all four games. So he he wasn't taken off the field 100% of the time. One other thing to factor in is that last year Gibbs missed two games due to injury. Monty missed three due to injury. If either player is out yes. on a top five offense, you've got gold at the position. Yep. So you not only are, you know, um, you know Gibbs is going to be good, I think, regardless, but Monty becomes upper echelon if Gibbs goes down. Yes, the Green Bay Packers. We'll talk Do about well. them. Amon Ra is. Do we have to talk about him? I it just just real quickly. Wide receiver four, third most receptions through the first uh, three years of his of career, and draft him. He is great. There's nothing else to add for Amon Ra. Okay. No, Are you we with did, that, no, we, Jason? No, we did not need to talk about him. Okay. Yes. Draft am, Amon Ra from Mike Wright. I am 100 percent with that. He's peas and thank you. <laughs> he's, uh, he is the center of this passing yeah. game and imagine what he could do if he takes his father's advice <sighs> and starts down a uh, refreshing coca-cola classic at the half hashtag non-sponsor refreshing coca-cola classic at halftime yeah 
Yeah, I mean, I um, I hope it's like a 64 ouncer in a big styrofoam <laughs> cup. It's, on it's, the sidelines. It's on the side and of the And his dad is just like, it's got take a, this. He's got a big gulp. <laughs> well, the nice thing about that receiver documentary is that um, – vomiting coke everywhere Amon Ra is is an alpha in personality like this is a player that it, it's unacceptable for him to not receive a quantity of targets which you oh there he is which you love to see yeah you want a player that's going to go out there and and be you know loud enough and yeah they don't have options outside of him in the in the wide receiver room yet all right Green Bay Nine and eight last year coming in with a seven and a half win total. This year it's up to ten and a half. It was the coming out party for Jordan Love. Um, so impressive. They ended up 13th in points per game over the course of the entire year. Uh, there is some turnover here, right? Aaron Jones is out the door. That That is a name that has been synonymous with the Packers for so long. But there's stability as well. And their head coach, Matt LaFleur, someone we trust so much with the offense. Jordan Love. I don't think he has a deal yet. It's coming. Like Jordan Love is getting his money. And then you have a group of wide receivers that has been the talk of much of the offseason of how you break down. Like this is where I don't want to be trapped. I don't want to be so unsure of which wide receiver is going to perform that we ignore what could be a top five offense in football. And just, I mean, literally, I mean, not to, I mean, just to highlight it, Jason, we were in the middle of a draft yesterday in the mock draft. Now it was late, but you didn't take one guy you wanted mm -hmm. in Dontavian Wicks because you were worried it would be Romeo Dobbs. Yeah, it would be wrong to take him ahead of a Romeo Dobbs. So you took Dobbs, and I think that that could happen. That could happen earlier in the draft, right? For people that are looking at Jaden Reed or looking at Christian Watson, where oh gosh, am I making oh am I making the wrong move with this guy at this spot? Like you, I don't think you're going to feel comfortable drafting Packers wide receivers. And that's the headline to me is that they're going to be very good. Jaden Reed currently is the earliest at wide receiver 34 in the back of the sixth. Yeah. I mean, you talk about uh, Jason, you just brought up the chargers. The first charger player was in the, is, is in the eighth round. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if the first wide receiver for a team in which you look at J what Jordan love did over the back half of the year is being drafted in this late sixth round. That's that. You're going to have Packers in the top of the wide receiver rankings. Yes. And so the the real question is, is like, are we getting ourselves distracted with Dobbs and Dontavian? Should we kind of toss them out a little bit and focus on these other two players? I, th I Because, think you know, Wicks took advantage, yes, over the last five games of the year. Two of those games, there was no Christian Watson. One of those games, there was no Jaden Reed. Like, should we, should we try to – Hone in on a couple of guys I, so we don't miss the boat. I think the hard part with Jaden Reed, and we discussed him on the footcast a, uh, a few days ago, of Jaden Reed is a very good player, but if you're looking for ceiling, he doesn't seem like a player that can make that jump into being a top 15 wide receiver. And so it's it's to me, it's identifying the player – who can do that? And I, I think Christian Watson has the physical ability if he can stay on the on the field. And when he was on the field and everybody was healthy, he was the alpha in terms of target share. Uh, I think it was like at a twenty one percent. If that, but that's right off the top of my head. So, Jaden Reed is a safe pick for depth, but the ceiling's not there. Christian Watson far riskier, but has the ceiling. And I think then between Dobbs and Wicks. It's almost like we – it's the untapped ceiling that we haven't seen from Wicks. I think Dobbs is more going to be like a Jaden Reed type of a player where great depth piece, very usable player because he'll have whatever eight-plus touchdowns, but I don't think that he can make the jump into being there. So I, working through it, I think I'm, I would narrow it down almost of – it comes down to team build, but if I'm shooting for the stars, I'm going to go Watson or I'm going to go Wicks. I actually really like the way that you broke that out. Well, thank and I, you. And I, I, I agree. I agree with that. I think that uh, Dobbs and Reed are safer, lower ceiling options. And when you're in the back half of the draft, where all these guys are, I'm shooting for. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm shooting for the moon. Yeah, I, the problem with Watson has been staying healthy. 
Yeah. Being on the field to fulfill the great potential that we see. He's I still, leveling out his hamstrings, Yeah, Andy. well, we He's, all want to do that, don't we? I don't care I'll at all about my hamstrings. I'll take one real strong hamstring, yeah, me, honestly. Yeah. I was with – uh I was doing some workouts with a trainer, and he told me that my hamstrings are genetically so inflexible <laughs> <laughs> that it defies the way he understands a human body to work, which Jason yeah. and I have been in training together before, and we both share the same DNA. Mm -hmm. it, like if 23 and me ran it on my hamstrings, they'd be like, he doesn't have any. No, there, there's, there's oh, something man. genetically wrong with us, and we used to have hamstring offs. Of like who, <laughs> who could not stretch? If the you're best. laying on the ground and the trainer picks your foot up off the ground, how early does your knee bend? Because yeah. mine is right away. Yeah, yeah. Jason's might be worse than mine, that but went such a direction that I I thought you were seriously going to come in hot. Of I was working out with the trainer guys, and he said genetically my hamstrings are incredible. No. They're so beautiful. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> they are flawless. Apparently, I have very like uh, special very... shoulder uh, flexibility. Okay, because you do those tests where can you grab your arm behind uh -huh. your and I'm, I'm my shoulders are good. So you, you wherever the flexibility like for my sun, shoulders, self sunscreen, not a problem. No, I get Andy. it all. No devil wings. <laughs> I, I got a Here, here's that. what I'll say about Jordan Reed, real quick. This was a rookie season for Jordan Reed, where he put up sixty four. Uh, sorry, yes, I got Jordan Love and Jaden Reed combined. For Jaden Reed, sixty four for seven ninety three and eight. Missed time due to injury at the end of the year. Very impressive rookie season. My eyeballs told me all last year this is the best wide receiver they have on the team. I'm going to stay with that. That's my pick. Um, I don't have the injury dance with Christian Watson, and I do think Wicks, Wicks and Dobbs indict the production of Watson more than they do Reed in terms of sure, the yeah, type yeah. of player. So in that regard, I do agree he's safe. I think he has a little bit more of a cracked door for upside than you guys do. But that's uh, it's a good talk through. We'll do it again. I know and, it. And I mean to highlight that Reed ran two routes with two wide receivers on the field. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, he is their third wide receiver. Yep. Yeah, no question. Now, do you just do you just take Jordan Love and say I think he's got one of the best wide receiver cores I, in yeah. the league? We haven't even talked about Musgrave. Um, who looked great as a rookie at the tight end position. So many places he could throw a touchdown. Or Bo Melton. Or are you saying – Oh, Butterman. Butterman. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> or are you saying that, you know, if if you take the, the wide receivers out and you just look at what a great season, you know, Jordan Love finishes the, as the quarterback five, but he's not really a mobile quarterback. He's not going to add a lot on the ground. And we talk a lot about pocket passers needing to – throw a ton and have, have a very high touchdown rate, which he had last year to be successful. So where are you on him? Is, was that his first season and he kind of broke out and showed he is special? I, or was that kind of the best? Because no, Derek Carr great. had a season just like this. Yeah, he's great. No, he's better than Derek Carr. And 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 you have now talked me into uh, adding Jaden Reed and Jordan Love to my stack list. That's what you've talked me into. Because it, you know Jordan Love's an eighth-round pick. I can go five rounds, pick my favorite five, you know, five players, yeah. and then I can go Jaden Reed, wait around, Jordan Love, have a stack on an offense I believe in. Or even, I mean, if, if you have or to. Or Watson if you wanted to. I was going to say, you even you have the buffer of, like in the seventh, if you want to just make sure you get the Jaden Reed, Jordan Love stack, take Love around early. That's, yeah, six, that's seven. nothing. Um, no, I, I, I think we should always be smart about pocket passers that have kind of outlandish seasons. Jordan Love was cooking last year. I mean, um, this was this was awesome. He was, I think, the second highest in passing touchdowns, air yards, red zone pass attempts. They were amazing as an offense, throwing the ball in the red zone. They were tied for the second most red zone passing touchdowns. 18 touchdowns, zero interceptions. Which, who does that remind you of? Aaron, Aaron Rodgers. Rodgers. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, they Done, Al, done it again. You know, Al, Al might get a hard time from us, you know, all the time, like every minute of every day. Yeah, I do. But <laughs> none of it could compensate for how blessed he is as a Packer fan. Al can't be hurt because he's gone from Favre to Rogers to Love. So just remember that when you're crying in the corner of the office, Al. Okay? I will. Thank, Thank you. you. Um. The running backs. Yeah, we're going to talk running backs now. So they, they went out and surprised everybody, spent the money on Josh Jacobs. Last year, 
four rushing touchdowns for this team on 368 attempts between Jones and Dillon. So get it together, Aaron Jones. When, Jeez. That's like an outlandish, uh, worse than the decade type of number on that many attempts. So are there running backs do? I mean, Josh Jacobs has a nose for the end zone. When you go look at what he did last year, even when he was inefficient, he still had a good year because he scored a bunch. You know, nose for the buffet last year. Okay. <laughs> All right. He wasn't that fat. <laughs> no, I know. He was super shredded. He was shredded. <laughs> but Jacobs arrives. Marshawn Lloyd was the third round investment at running back. We like the offense. Um, we've talked a lot about Josh Jacobs being somebody we're very afraid to draft. Man, the, risk and reward. I mean, yeah. he, this is a guy who led the league uh, in rushing a couple years ago. The only thing I will caution is that Matt LaFleur has said this a billion times before. He is a committee coach. He wants to keep his guys fresh. So you're looking for the most efficient running back in a committee. You're not looking for just who gets the ball first. Now, that's what made Aaron Jones so great. He was so electric on a per-touch basis. It worked in a committee. Josh Jacobs has found success when he got massive volume. You know, this is where I lean towards, if you want a piece of the running game, super late in the draft, Marshawn Lloyd, explosive rookie coming in, and some of the stuff that the coaches are talking yeah. about, about whether they're going to take it slow like they did rookie. They, you know, they asked um, their OC, are you going to take it slow when, like you did with um, – A.J. Dillon, he said, no, I'd like to get him out there as much as possible. He's got a skill set that's a bit different from A.J.'s as far as his speed. be nice to get him his ball. And sp I know, AJ, A.J.'s just not Did bad. he say that without laughing? Uh, I'm I'm watching the video. He did say that without laughing. Impressive. Yeah. Let, me, let me flag something we've never talked about with Marshawn Lloyd when you look at how things could work out in that backfield. He will be a compliment to Jacobs no matter what. Correct. Yeah, or like Jacobs is a solidified piece, right? Mm-hmm. Lloyd is going to have to take advantage of early opportunities on that team, which you said that they're eager to give him. Here's the one caveat with Lloyd I, I want you to put in the back of your head. Eight fumbles over 291 career attempts, second smallest hands of any running back in the scouting combine. Oh, no. So if you want to understand how that – and they have Dylan on the roster, right? So they do, Currently. They are not forced, and they have other players, right? We're, who, who, who contributed? Patrick Taylor? Small. No. These hands. Oh, we're bringing it back. <laughs> oh, let's get that done. Got a new baby hands here. We, oh, baby. I hands. guess I didn't know this. No, about we his, call it Jewel. Small, tiny. He's got baby little bitty hands. baby hands, and he's fumbled eight times on three hundred attempts. Little Jewel hands. You fumbled <laughs> twice as a rookie. Oh, that's a problem. See you later. So just keep that in mind. I'm not trying sure. to throw yeah, yeah. cold water on his talent, but just as a rookie on a team with expectations, it's always about. Can you start the season not like Tank Bigsby? That's what I call it. Oh, sure, yeah, try yeah, not yeah. to Bigsby. The schedule, yeah, which is called volleyballing the ball into the other team's hands. Yeah, he's like Bigsby's like I. I was gonna fumble it. Maybe I'll just throw it up in the air. Right. See what happens. Their schedule, their opening schedule, week one, tough on, one on, on the road. road against Philly. Don't love that. But then Indianapolis at home on the road against Tennessee at home against Minnesota. That's not. Oh, that's, that's not great. too bad. That's great. All right, we're going to take a break. Come back with Minnesota. All right, it was a tough year for the Vikings. Seven and ten. Injuries plagued this team. It was really hard for the first time for fantasy managers to deal with no Justin Jefferson. It was a bad time. And then it was also hard to um, to not to not have Kirk Cousins. As this rely and and to be going into the year without Kirk Cousins, the win total last year was eight and a half. This year it's six and a half from Vegas. They have the sixth most difficult schedule and a brutal division. Like, yeah, I mean the, the Bears I, I just should don't, be legitimately good this year. And the other two teams we talked about are both in contention to to win the division and and go on a maybe a Super Bowl hunt. So. Yeah, this is not going to be easy sledding for the Minnesota Vikings this season. So that, I mean, that's the overview. Now, we don't know who the quarterback's going to be. Darnold, McCarthy, some of some of what you just said, that, that, that like looking like they might be the worst team in the division is one of the reasons that I am the least bullish of our, of our three-pack on Aaron Jones because you're having an older, 
uh, running back that a team, you know, we can debate how much they wanted him back. I always go with the, if you really wanted him back, you bring him back, you know, situation. Um, price was too much for them. They moved on to Josh Jacobs, whatever. But if this team is not moving the football the way we want them to, if they're not an efficient offense, if the quarterback is changing halfway through the year, those are some of the things I'd be concerned about, especially if Ty Chandler and what he did last year gets worked into the mix. Um, there's a lot of questions, I think, beyond Jefferson. Like Jefferson, we're all in the opinion of like, you know, draft him, play him. He's a superstar. Maybe you need to ignore all the peripheral around him and just do that. But Jason made a good point on the mock draft show of what he really sees the ceiling as compared to some of these other top-tier options. Jefferson ended up going late in the first. Yeah, and that's probably where he should go. This is a guy that is almost guaranteed to be a wide receiver one and almost guaranteed to not be a top three wide receiver with the quarterback play and the expected touchdown availability he'll have. So, you know, a low-end wide receiver one, that's that's great. Um well, I, sorry, I am distracted. Were you going to hit the breaking? News? I was going to hit no, the breaking news, but it. it's not a. Uh, this is this is news to me. I have just found out right here on the show after all of this off season of talking Aaron Jones down. Mike is one spot lower than I am on Aaron Jones. I got him. At, I didn't know that either. Now I got him at twenty five. Jason at thirteen. Mike at twenty six. Now was this something that was inverted? That was I didn't. Or, even, I just went to check. Or were you listening? Uh no, <laughs> it, no I've, I've kind of been in the middle, but uh yeah you the, the two of you guys, but I like I feel the the way that the coaches talked about Ty Chandler, like that kid is going to play, and it would shock me if this is a full Aaron Jones led situation for for an offense that is probably going to struggle. So a committee with all that, it's like Aaron Jones will be he'll have some huge spike games for sure but he's not a target for me. Yeah, I, I will just throw this out. The, the last time we saw Aaron Jones, he was great. Great. Yeah. This wasn't a player like the last time we saw Josh Jacobs where he was struggling and then got injured. He was the running back one on the week to start the year last year. He got injured, dealt with injuries throughout the, the season. When he came back the last four weeks, he, he was you know 13 for 53, 21 for 127, 20 for 120, 22 for 111, and he works in the passing game. Rookie quarterbacks aren't usually great for their wide receivers, but rookie quarterbacks are pretty good for running backs. They they tend to lean on the run a little bit more. Um, it, it's not necessarily the the high upside, but a high floor for that. So this is a team that has been massacred by Aaron Jones for years. Yeah, they they were surprised that he came to the market, and they went and got him. And so they're I you know this is a smart offensive system. I didn't see him lose a step. And so I think he is going to be very relevant. I, you know, whether he can be a running back one on this team, maybe not, but you're not drafting him like that. So I, I do think it's an okay pick where he's going right now. Where is he going? Fifth, fifth, sixth round? Fifth round. Yeah, into RB the fifth. 18. The first five weeks of the season, they're heavy underdogs yeah, in most of those great. games. They go to New York to face the Giants. Then they play San Francisco, Houston, in Green Bay against the Jets. Yo, what? <laughs> Do you Bot think that was their GM's reaction to the schedule release, Mike? Did they just go, yo? I think they went and they wrote down <laughs> Why week, week six by week quarterback change. That's what they wrote down. Why you, why? That's why Darnold's starting. Darnold will start. Oh, he is being Hawkinson sacrificed. Won't, Hawkinson won't be there. Addison, who knows? Yeah. I mean, I, I would love to have this conversation about, hey, go, go get me another pass catcher. I mean, that's your best argument for Aaron Jones. Yep. Find me a pass catcher outside of Justin Jefferson that I have to start in week one. Go. If Addison is suspended by any chance, then it is Aaron Jones. I mean, right now, uh, I brought him up. Is it Jalen Naylor? He's the, he's profiling as the three slash two if Addison's gone. And then Brandon Powell in Dynasty could be involved as well. Those are two names for deeper. Na hit that nasty boys drop if I'm saying Jalen <laughs> Naylor's name. But those are those are guys that could see the field. How about some, some Johnny Munt? <laughs> no. No. Johnny Munt making more money at the tight end position than Trey McBride this year. Johnny Munt is such a tight end name. <laughs> ah, yeah, so look. Not promising. Not promising to have a quarterback you can start. The running back room, we'll see. 
but could be very committee based on a, a low opportunities around the red zone. Um, Austin, we do like Kevin O'Connell. I, I mean, I like the opportunity for them to – like, I think he's going to want to do stuff in this offense he won't be able to execute because of the personnel. That I agree. schedule is so rough for drafting Minnesota Vikings. Yeah. I mean, it, look – Yeah, you want to add something to the Jefferson conversation? Jeff yeah, I mean, like, Jefferson still – draft him in the first round. He's the greatest wide receiver in football right now. But that is – you want, me to add, be, you want me to add to it? Because those, sure. I read five games. They're not favored in their first nine. So you go beyond the five games I just read. Sixth most difficult strength of schedule. That's not That's fair. That's not great. Let's talk about Chicago. All right. Fun. Uh, last year, seven and a half win total. They were two and six in one score games. The Justin Fields experiment is over. This year, projected win total of eight and a half. They have the third easiest schedule for 2024. And, you know, I could sit here and give you all their numbers on offense last year. I don't care yeah, they, about them. Yeah, you throw them away. And um, this was a defense that was number one in rushing yards per game. It took major steps. It's going to continue to improve, I think. And like I said, Matt Eberflus is currently the betting favorite to win coach of the year. And we got Shane Waldron in as the offensive he coordinator. also looks like – my number one pick to coach an Icelandic yes! hockey team. <laughs> yes, that is where I'm looking at the uh. picture, and he is from Mighty Ducks 2. <laughs> Give me the name, Kyle. Wolf, Wolf the, the Dennis Stanson. <laughs> oh, he breaks in with his – Kyle is always <laughs> on the draw for Mighty Ducks or uh, recently Angels in the Outfield statistics from the movie. Impressive. Wolf the Dentist? <laughs> Come on, man. This is Pat Riley's haircut. It's like Iberflu saw that movie. He's like, that's the look. This is Pat that's Riley it. on the sideline. We're doing it again. Show I will gonna... avoid the sun and I will grease my hair. I mean, is this um, showtime in Chicago is the question? Because Caleb Dude, Williams. Kyle, with their, Jimmy just posted the picture. It's the same guy. It is the same guy. <laughs> Wait, this is the actor. Yes. This is the this is the actual <laughs> Matt Eberflus on his in... IMDb played. Wolf, the dentist, is that what it was? Like? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Caleb Williams just signed his deal. They said, "Let's equip him as well as we possibly can." Veteran pass catcher extraordinaire Keenan Allen, welcome to the Bears. DJ Moore breakout campaign with Justin Fields, despite the struggles. We um, we've okay. got DeAndre Swift to help you in the back out of the backfield. I mean, Gerald Everett's there. Roma Cole Dunze. Komet's there. Roma they, Dunze's they spent there. The ninth pick. They went out and and got a great veteran. They traded for one of the best wide receivers while they already had a good wide receiver, and then they said, "Nah, not done." Yeah. Number nine pick. We're drafting one of the best rookie wide receivers in a loaded, top-heavy class. You can't enter a better situation. You know what it reminds me than of? Caleb Williams. It reminds me of when Cincinnati made the pick on Jamar Chase when we were all sitting here going, you know, we recognize T. Higgins could be the one of an offense. You have Tyler Boyd who mm -hmm. was contributing at a high, you know what I mean? And, and then you they, need Panay Sewell because your offensive line yep. is trash. And they said, you know what, let's double down on making sure our rookie is successful. And, uh, you know, Panay Sewell's is amazing. But, um, but Jamar Chase is as well. So they have equipped him. They have a good defense. They said goodbye to Darnell Mooney. I think they have three running backs that will contribute in this offense. To what degree – that is yet to be seen. I just don't want people to uh, – DeAndre Swift is going to be their higher volume piece of the committee, no question. But I don't want people to forget about, um, like, Roshan Johnson and, you know, there's been positive positivity around him in, so far. Roshan Johnson is one of my favorite best ball picks. He's he's going so late I don't really understand it. He's, he's being drafted like – like uh, Khalil Herbert is the clear backup, and then Roshan Johnson is not a part of this offense. And I think Roshan Johnson will be the number two running back for this team. He's great on third downs. He's he's a quality back. Um, and he, you know I I prefer the younger, more explosive guy. I would I would firmly bet Khalil will be the RB two. As do the average person because oh well, he it, called you average. Yeah, he just said you're ordinary. How's that, how's that feel? It, it's Mr. Normal. Basic. It, basic Mike. It feels fine. Roshan Johnson had many times throughout the season where he should have taken over. 
Like, and he he did not. And it was they were like, nah, this Deonta Foreman guy. And then Foreman comes in and has great games. And then Foreman is banished himself to Siberia. And they're like, should we put the the rookie in? They're like, nope. Back to Khalil Herbert. Well, to be fair, he was a rookie. I mean, that you know, he was he was uh, just getting in there, and he led all Chicago running backs in third down snaps and snaps in pass protection last I, year as I, a rookie. My that, judgment that sounds like DeAndre. Swift. I haven't made the judgment call on him yet. I think I think we can we can see how this year goes. Four point three a carry as a rookie, limited opportunities, didn't earn it. Right, didn't earn the yeah, that's the, the top issue. job. I get it. The wide receiver room is. Really interesting. It's heavily dependent on a big year from a rookie quarterback, Caleb Williams. I I had a we had a show a couple months ago where I was talking about expectations for rookie quarterbacks. Really looking at what's a fair expectation to provide your re receiver room if you're the number one pick versus being just a first round pick versus just being a rookie quarterback in general. It definitely lent itself to you're the number one overall pick. You're Number one wide receiver numbers are much better. It's around a thousand yards. It's around seven touchdowns. So, you know, if it was just DJ Moore and no one else, it'd be easy to say, okay, Moore's going to be that guy. We're getting the murkiness of, well, Odunze is really talented and Allen is really experienced and DJ Moore had a really good year last year. Yeah, I mean, when when you dug deep on that research, which was great, you did find that most of those really great, you know, the wide receivers connected to one hundred and one quarterbacks like like Steve Smith. You know, Steve Smith was awesome, but also it was like him and it's no Steve one Smith. and no one else. And so here you're going to have rookie numbers, and I think they're going to be prolific rookie numbers. I think Caleb Williams is going to have one of the better rookie wide receiver seasons or rookie quarterback seasons of all time. But even that but is I, not. I think that's the, the – sorry to derail the conversation, but that's like – that's it. Where uh, Caleb Williams is being drafted as the QB 11, which is like – that's not the worst thing in the world. Like he's he's not being steamed up to being you know like a top eight guy. I like that phrase. Being steamed up. <laughs> yeah, we never used that before. <laughs> he is being drafted in like what the eighth round, and it, the price is it's it's palatable. Jason, but, but what does prolific look? That's like what I'm to asking. You? I'm gonna put you on the spot. Jason Moore, Caleb Williams over under four thousand one hundred and eight passing yards. I would take the under based on history. Touchdowns over under twenty three passing touchdowns. Oh, I've got him exactly at twenty three. That's that's my projection for this him. Game has not been fun. <laughs> prolific, um, my butt. The, yeah, but I mean, no, I just, no, no. That's that's. I what just I'm gave that you C.J. Stroud's two numbers. So if he doesn't, Stroud was the quarterback eleven with forty one hundred yards and twenty three touchdowns. If you throw four thousand yards and twenty three touchdowns for an NFL quarterback for fantasy purposes, that sucks. For a rookie quarterback, that is prolific. That those are you're in the top ten of both of those numbers. Like that that's that is an unbelievable rookie season. Have, so that's where let's say he throws forty three hundred and twenty five. That's one that's one of the best, not necessarily fantasy, because the best fantasy rookies are are mobile running quarterbacks, but as far as, you know, a guy that's gonna just put up a ton through the air. That's as good as it ever gets, and then you split it, split that up three ways. Yeah, I don't know if you split it up three ways, man. Well, that's the question: is is what's the pecking order of the wide receiver? Yeah, and that would also make him the best quarterback the Bears have ever had statistically by a <laughs> wide margin. I do think that's possible. Um, you know, seventeen game season, amazing peripherals like the defense, the coaching, the the receivers. I think Caleb Williams could go do that for sure. Um, but you know, what who becomes his favorite? Right, like yeah. it, it, is Keenan Allen a long uh, have a long play? I mean, you have, um, you have to pay up for DJ Moore compared to the other guys. Roma Dunze, you're a rookie. There's a lot of question marks about whether you're gonna. I mean, you're not you're not out snapping DJ Moore and Keenan Allen in this offense. So three wide, that's your situation, right? And, and you do have you what's know, their twelve personnel numbers. Well, it's hard. Probably it's, have it, that. it's hard to say because you you've got uh, Shane Waldron coming over from who has been the Seattle offensive coordinator. And if you look at what Seattle did last year, they had three similar players, right? You had uh, a, a speedster in Tyler Lockett. Oh, don't that's, say that. That's kind of like uh, DJ Moore. You had your really great slot route runner in JSN. That's Keenan Allen, and you had your big bodied guy like DK Metcalf. And um, so so 
if they're implementing a similar offensive system to what we saw in Seattle, Keenan scares the crap out of me because the amount or of – Catch the ball 40 yards behind the line of scrimmage? Yes, exactly. His average depth of target is going to be zero. They were 11th and 12 personnel last year, by the way. Seattle was with that's, Walden. That's a compelling argument because uh, I was just about to say, I think Keenan's the one I'm going to take. I don't want to pay up for DJ Moore, and I don't want to do the – well, I'll just take the last one because – I'm not going to bet on the rookie. I, I definitely have softened on DJ Moore from where I was in February, March, okay. and looking forward to the season. Or maybe not February, March, but like a couple months yeah, ago, yeah. Um, because of just the fact that you have three talented players, you got a really talented tight end, you got a pass catching wide receiver or running back, and then you have a cap on rookie production historically, where we've never seen a double digit touchdown year. So it's not like I can say, okay, he spreads it around, but DJ Moore puts up ten or eleven. That's really, really unlikely. But this could be a really, really good team where they win a lot of games and they're more disappointing for fantasy. I think that's what's going to happen. I think they're going to be a very exciting team. I also believe that we'll, there will be massive games You know where Caleb Williams does go out and throw yeah. 350 and 4 in a single week and you're, you're thrilled and excited. But it's probably going to be a little bit of a learning curve here. It's time. It's time for uh, – well, no, it's not. I'll wait a second. I want to hear about DeAndre Swift real quick because we don't we don't talk about him enough or a lot. Sixth-round pick right now. I think we're all a little lower than ADP on him. Why is that? Because 47% of his yards came before contact last year behind the Philadelphia Eagles offensive line. He had – I mean, you saw those cameras, those Madden angle cameras from behind the quarterback where it's like, dude, I could have got one yard yeah. through that line. Um, because you know it was like five yards to the left, five yards to the right, the holes he was running through. Now, this isn't a bad offensive line, and obviously you're not going to be stacking the box against the running game with all these wide receivers. I think DeAndre Swift is going to be okay. They went after him immediately in free agency. This he was, fit the scheme perfectly. This was clearly a desire, so I think they have a plan for him. He'll be involved. Um, you know, He's being drafted as the running back 21 which doesn't feel too bad. If you want to take a shot on him, everything I said about uh, rookie quarterbacks being bad for wide receivers but good for the floor of a running back applies here to DeAndre Swift. I just don't – Has Mike forgiven him? Have Are you? you ready to jump back in? I was going to ask the question of what do you make about a player – I know the money's there, but it's it's his third team in three years, right? Like, Yeah, the, correct. the he, Brandon Cooks of the running back position. Like, people – they tire of it. I, it's, I, it's, it has happened. Like that is, and and maybe it was just a situation of Philadelphia would have loved to get him back, but Saquon he, he played his way into a contract, and they were able to get Saquon Barkley. So maybe that is literally the entirety of the explanation. But it's hard, man. But I mean, we, Detroit we know, did that. We know who he is. We know who DeAndre Swift is. He's a good running back who can help a team in trunks. He's not going to be great. He's not going to be a top fantasy. Here's his four not seasons. A cow. Here's his four seasons as fantasy finish. Running back 18, running back 19, running back 22, running back 23. He's been drafted as a running back 21. Sounds about right. Oh, I, that's the Terry McLaurin of the running back spot. You know, yeah. I, I think that he's actually positionally not a good running back. I think that he is an extremely talented, fast, f f athlete. human being, an athlete, and a, like, and a competent football player, but just not uh, the way that like Jameer Gibbs couldn't get on the field because he was doing – boneheaded things that we can't necessarily see i'm guessing that has an influence on it all right i'm gonna be boring uh, are you yeah detroit green bay chicago minnesota okay i am going to be less boring i'm going packers lions bears vikings i'm so happy to hear you say that jason because if you both had the lions at the top i'm like someone's got to be <laughs> someone has to have the courage to put the packers first so you did it. I don't have to do it. <laughs> Lions, Lions, Packers, Bears, Vikings. All right. Tuesday we will cover the NFC South. A reminder on uh, – yeah, Jeremy is already correcting or congratulating Jason on his pick of the Packers at the top. Nobody picked Chicago, obviously. Very close, yeah. in, very close in the odds with uh, Green Bay in terms of the um, betting odds. They certainly could win this division. Yeah, but Guns Mahoney could beat up all the other coaches. That's fair. That's true. That's Dan Campbell, everybody. Uh, the NFC South on Tuesday, ultimatedraftkit.com. Head over there right now. Pick up the Ultimate Draft Kit to help you dominate your draft. Get ready for 
uh, what's coming very soon, draft day. It's almost here. All right, that is going to do it for us. If you want to watch the show, go over to YouTube, youtube.com slash the fantasy footballer. Subscribe, click the bell over there. Back with another show on Tuesday. Enjoy your weekend. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.